Oh, hi, it's Sharon Halson, Associate Professor at Australian Catholic University, and uh, you're listening to The Physical Performance Show. And the is failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll aim to bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. We do this across a range of different episodes, including interest editions, coaches' corners, featured performers, and expert editions. And on this week's show, we'll bring you a very, very exciting expert edition on all things athlete recovery. Follow in episode 187 success with Christy Ashwinden, New York Times bestselling author of Good To Go, what the athlete in all of us can learn from the strange science of recovery. We wanted to keep this recovery theme going. And in thinking about finding one of the world's preeminent experts on the topic, we could look no further than Dr. Shona Halson. By way of bio, Dr. Halson is an associate professor in the School of Behavioral and Health Sciences at the Australian Catholic University. Prior to this appointment, Shona was a senior physiologist at the Australian Institute of Sport for 15 years. Shona has a PhD in exercise physiology and has over 100 peer-reviewed publications in the areas of sleep, recovery, fatigue, and travel. Shona is an associate editor of the International Journal of Sports Physiology and Performance, and Shona was selected as the director of the Australian Olympic Committee's Recovery Centre for the 2008, 2012, and 2016 Olympic Games. Shona consults regularly to world's leading brands, including Nike and the Australian Open Tennis Tournament. Fittingly, Christy Ashwinden in Good To Go referenced Shona's work many times and cited Shona as the world's leading expert on recovery, who knows the recovery literature inside and out. Having been a leading contributor to the body of research and having 15 years plus experience in applying this science to athletes. This really is a fascinating deep dive into the science of athlete recovery and topics that Shona outlines include just what athlete recovery is and why it's important, why fewer athletes than you may perceive are actually overtrained, the critical role that sleep plays in optimizing an athlete's recovery and adaptability to training, the role that life's stressors play in an athlete's recovery, why it's okay to not feel great after every training session, and why listening to your body and backing off at times are absolutely critical. Shona also explores the science around popular recovery modalities, including cryotherapy and massage therapy, and Shona shares her physical challenge for the week. That's something that I know will challenge you. So get ready with a pen and paper, and dare I say you may need to listen back to this one numerous times to take from it all of the learnings. This is my conversation with Dr. Shona Halson, Associate Professor and Senior Exercise Physiologist on all things athlete recovery. Shona Halson, I am one very excited uh, host of the show here uh, to have you on the the physical performance show today. So welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for having me on. You are prolific. Uh, I mentioned before we threw live, uh, I finished Chris, Christy Ashwinden's New York best, New York Times bestseller recently, Good to Go. And uh, Shona Halson, you were perhaps the most referenced expert noted through that book, maybe six or seven times. And uh, and from Christie's writing, she introduces you to the readers of her book, the world's leading expert on recovery, who knows the recovery literature inside and out, having been a leading contributor to body of the body of research in recovery and having 15 plus years applying the science to athletes. So 
with that sort of uh, that sort of introduction, uh, shall we explore this weird and wonderful world? Yeah, it sounds sounds good. And uh, and further to more to that, uh, I jumped over to one of my favourite podcasts, the Nike podcast, and here's Shona sandwiched between, I think it was Rory McIlroy and uh, and LeBron James. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm sure I'm just as well known as those two. <laughs> Sitting right where you needed to be. But in all yeah. seriousness, um, you know, you, uh, you you consult to some of the world's leading organisations, including Nike. Uh, it must be a real thrill. I enjoy that side of things. Like, I obviously love the research, but I like the translation into practice. And so, you know, being able to... Um, put through um, to other people like what we've learned and, um, you know, have people out there um, be able to have that knowledge in a, you know, fairly succinct and easy way so that they can go out and and go and improve themselves in, you know, whether that's, you know, sport or, um, you know, we'd we now know there's a lot of people interested in sleep and well-being and health in the corporate world. So, uh, yeah, it's good to just try and get that message out there. And I really feel like you mentioned sleep that the message is out there, and uh, and we want to we want to dive into that today. But Shona, to paint a bit of a, a picture for your career to date, contextually, uh, can you take us through? I mean, you started with a PhD in fatigue in, in cyclists and spent you know 15 years pioneering the recovery centre at the Australian Institute of Sport. So. Can you give us the uh, the timeline condensed of, of your professional career to date? Yeah, so um, exactly right. Finished a PhD um, in 2002. I'm fortunate enough to work with um, Aska Yukendrop, who's done some some great work in cycling and, and nutrition. I um, started at the AIS um, straight after that, or just right at the same time, actually, which was very fortunate for me. There was a job advertised for a fatigue and recovery specialist, and I was like, this never happens, um, and this sounds like me. So um, I was very fortunate to get the position there. And yes, yeah, so part of the role there was obviously developing the recovery centre, but also putting some evidence evidence based practice around recovery. So there were some things that were happening. Um, and of course, you know, Australia is very evidence based. So let's do some research and find out if all these strange things athletes are doing um, are actually working. So we had a real focus on both the servicing components, so working with athletes as well as, as the research. And uh, it was typically around recovery. But then um, in the last sort of five to 10 years, we really started moving into the, the sleep aspect. And obviously, that being the the primary recovery tool that we have available to us, and we started looking at that um, in a little a little more depth. And then at the end of uh, sorry, the middle of last year, um, I moved across to Australian Catholic University, where I have a pretty much a research role. Um, I, I have minimal teaching, uh, and I'm still able to um, to consult to teams and work with teams and and conduct research on, on athletes. So um, very very similar to what I was previously doing anyway so yeah it's been a um, a nice transition over the sort of the last year and a half and from uh canberra to the beautiful sunshine coast so uh you're uh, seeing the best of the world huh hey? <laughs> yes i can't complain being back on the sunshine coast it's uh it's one of my favorite parts of the world without question <laughs> oh, beautiful shona you uh you know recovery uh you've spent your working professional research and you know clinical if you like life around this uh it seems like such an obvious you know uh answer you're going to give but i'm so interested to ask this recovery what is it and why does it matter for athletes yeah, it sounds like a simple question, and it should be. Um, but I think because recovery is so multifaceted, um, that it's hard to give a really simple answer. But the the one that I that I usually use is, it's about um, restoring the athlete physically as well as psychologically to be able to train or compete again at the at the level that's required. And I sort of say the level that's required is because sometimes um, we don't want to recover fully. Um, There are times when obviously we do and we're in a competition setting and around certain training sessions, but there may be times that we don't want to recover fully. So I talk about... um, physical and psychological recovery um, for what is for what is actually re- required. But when you think of, of sport and training, you think of a disturbance in homeostasis. So another simple way is, is returning the body back to homeostasis or back to balance. Restoring the athlete physically as well as psychologically to be able to train or compete at the required level. And then you mentioned that there's times when you may not want an athlete uh, to, you know, to get back to that 
to, to, to be at a different level uh, or to fully re- recover, is that that sort of uh, concept which I know you've been, you know, uh, looking at and, and playing with probably the wrong phrase, but of periodized recovery? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. And it's a real hot topic at the moment. It's probably the biggest area of interest in recovery, and that's can you over-recover? Can you do too much recovery? And so like we periodise training now, we think about, and we periodise nutrition, we think about periodising recovery. And so if you look at um, a training program for, you know, for, for a year for one sport is obviously very different to another. So um, what we know around and what we think we should do around periodization, there's really no hard and fast rules of this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. It's about understanding the sport, where performance, opt- optimal performance is required and where you might take out a little bit of recovery to really drive the adaptation process. Because there's sort of two schools of thinking. There's and again, there's there's no black and white. There's obviously a grey in between. But one school of, of thought is, well, don't we need to have inflammation and soreness and fatigue and damage because that's what drives the adaptation process? And then the other side of the argument is, yes, but if we've got athletes who are less sore, um, who are less fatigued, then maybe they can do more in training and you add that up over a long period of time. Um, you know, maybe would they become more injury resilient, uh, then surely – you know, that's going to benefit performance. Um, and so we try to take those two concepts and merge them when it comes to, to periodization. So, you know, the old days of everyone jumps in an ice bath after every session, you know, those kinds of um, philosophies are are gone, hopefully. Um, and <laughs> definitely the more sophisticated sports um, are certainly starting to look at how we periodize and plan recovery into the training program. And just to, to make sure I, I, we captured it, those two concepts, just one more time, Shona, that you're merging in to consider this? Yeah, so one side is that soreness and damage and fatigue and inflammation are all important um, to adapting long-term to training. So why would we want to dampen that or blunt that with uh, recovery? And then the other side is, but if we're a bit less sore and we're a bit less tired, maybe we can get more quality and quantity in our training. Maybe we're less um, prone to injury and, and maybe we get sick less. So therefore, we're training more at a higher quality add that up over time and and you get your performance benefits that way. Yeah, wow. Well, I think I need to go lay down because my mind is <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to throw that into the uh, the training performance adaptation matrix. Wow. I mean, uh, I mean, practically, Shona, how have you seen this be implemented with, you know, with success? And then obviously mm-hmm. linking cause and effect, you know, there's so many multifacets, but are there any examples practically of, uh, of how this approach you've seen it work well? Yeah. So I think there's probably two examples that, um, so I can choose two sports that are almost very different to, to give you the picture. So for example, track cycling, um, where, Obviously, there's not a, a lot of um, contact damage. There's not a lot, of, lot, not a lot of impact, not a lot of eccentrics except in the gym. Um, so what you might see with these um, riders at the start of the season, they might be out on their bikes doing really long Ks um, and try to build up that base endurance. And you just might not want to do any recovery with them. You might just let them go, um, let them get a bit fatigued. And, you know, this is part of the training process. But then as they move more into competition settings, um, or where the coach wants really high intensity, high quality sessions, you might add some more recovery in. And then when they're at a major competition, like, you know, World Cups, World Champs or, or Olympics, then you will, I, I say you throw every recovery strategy at them that you can get because you're not worried about adaptation at that point. You're just worried about performance. Um, but then if you're working with, say, an AFL team where, you know, you have a relatively short preseason um, and then they're playing every single week and you want them to be as good as they can be every single week, you know that they're going to have some soreness from, from running, from tackling. Um, in that instance, the, your, your competition set, um, setting is a lot longer. And so your ability to to use recovery in there is is greater because you really want them to be as good as they can. You're really not thinking about adaptation during the season. You're just trying to get them through as as good as they can. So um, this whole concept of, oh, well, maybe we should stop doing recovery because we're going to decrease our adaptation. I think we need to think a bit more um, strategically about when it's put in 
to the training program and then there are opportunities with some sports um, to take that, um, take potentially some recovery away. So think strategically about it and it's contextual. You gave some great examples, track cycling, AFL, to the weekend warrior, if you like, Shona, or perhaps yep. the recreationally mm-hmm. competitive athlete. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, what suggestions, advice might you give around this periodization of recovery for that, that category of, uh, of athlete? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's almost just as important for that that category of athlete. And and I think when I think about um, people who are, um, you know, weekend warriors, as you say, but people who are recreationally quite competitive, you know, most of the time the, these individuals are working as well. So um, you have that extra, you know, stress um, and um, we know that, you know, the psychology and, and mental recovery is really important as well. So it's almost like there's, you know, recovery becomes particularly important, especially if they're um, doing high intensity blocks or whether they, you know, they have an opportunity of time where they can do some more training or get a good block of endurance training in. So I think um, with, with those individuals, uh, I, I do think that if they are, I always look at how far away um, they are from their competition. So if they're really aiming for one big race a year um, or two or three big races a year, uh, then again, you might look at, okay, there's some times where you may be able to take some recovery out earlier on where you, when you're preparing your base training for that, but then really sort of um, adding in your recovery as you get closer to those, um, to those major events. Um, but one of the things that I do um, I think is important and not just for athletes, but, you know, elite athletes, but for the everyday athlete is that we tend to see people trying to go, okay, well, you know, I've got 15 minutes so I can maybe use this gadget or I can use this piece of technology. Um, and they think that they've recovered when really what you need, what we ideally should be spending our time on is getting the basics of our recovery right, which is our sleep and our nutrition. Um, and so sometimes when we have busy people who are um, who are working as well as training and trying to fit in long rides or long runs on a weekend, um, what happens? happens is is sleep often um is the one thing that suffers or nutrition especially if they're busy working and traveling as well so i think yes recovery is important for those individuals but making sure they make time um for the for the real foundations of recovery which is uh, sleep and nutrition yeah well and it makes me think shona of uh former featured performer of this show six times so why i man winner uh mark allen he he, he commented you can't shortcut your biology <laughs> <laughs> it's so true and i just see now with um, especially some of the younger high level athletes that um, they just especially athletes that have you know a lot of professional team sport athletes that have access to money access to companies selling them things they want a quick fix and um, really there isn't you know so people will say oh you know I've spent this um, two thousand dollars on this device that's supposed to help me sleep I'm like I can give you the <laughs> advice that's going to fix your sleep and it's free um, but it just requires a bit of work um, but a lot of times people don't want to do that. They want the quick fix. They want to hack their recovery. And I understand that, but there's no substitute for um, for doing um, doing the right things. And as I said, getting your base right. Yeah, no, fantastic. Well, we want that advice from you, Shona, to save that $2,000. <laughs> and so let's, let's go there. Shona, uh, you did mention something, though, that I think it really uh, – I feel I've been around endurance sports since I was 11 and I'm now 38 – and professionally as a physio for 14, 15 years. And I feel like I've only really started to appreciate this with my own recreational athletic journey these days. But, you know, the the effect, and you mentioned this before, of, of work and of stressors, and you were quoted in, once again, Chrissy Ashwinden's book, They're Good to Go, is saying, saying this, to the body, stress is stress, whether it comes from a hard workout, a competition, a romantic breakup, or the anxiety of final exams. Okay, so can you just speak to that concept that it's not just the physical demands of training, there are other stressors, is that correct? Yeah, and I think that's... I think people have have kind of understood that to some degree, but I think now we're really starting to see more and more examples of that. And so what I might mean is, is you know, there'll be coaches that will say, oh, the, you know, the athletes are undergoing exams and, you know, you just 
can't get what I want out of them out of training. Um, or, you know, someone's going through a really stressful period of time in their life and one of the consequences of that might be bad sleep and therefore, um, you know, they struggle to, to do the training um, that they would normally do. So I think this understanding that, you know, I think we've always – as physiologists, and I'm as guilty as anyone else, is we spend our life in the periphery. We measure lactate. We we measure temperature. We look at blood flow. We understand all these things about the body. About the body, but the brain itself and how um, how we respond to both exercise and stress um, has kind of been off our radar a little bit. And so, I think understanding that. You know, when we're stressed, we have a physiological response. We have an increase in heart rate, an increase in sweat rate. Um, we can it can influence our ability to sleep properly. So this idea that um, when people are going through periods of stress, it can have a physical response, and that we probably need to really start factoring that in and understanding that more um, when it comes to training load and, and managing training. And you know, you add to that. Um, today's society where we're constantly connected with a, a phone, a smartphone, or a video game if you're maybe a younger athlete, um, we've just got this constant stimulation. And so having some time where we, uh, our brain is not um, totally stimulated um, can, be, can be really good. So I think just understanding that um, psychological stress can have a physiological response and we may need to be a little bit cautious about, um, about our training loads if there are some manifestations of that, um, of that stress. We know cortisol rises, you know, we know that there's a range of physiological and hormonal things that happen when you're stressed and um, that can have a, a physical response. And so, you know, if you are identifying a period of your life where there are those stressors uh, that aren't directly physical but having these uh, physiological effects, then I guess what the takeaway, Shona, is to just give yourself some grace and space that you may not be hitting it out of the park in training and, you know, proceed mm -hmm. as per how you feel and, you know, communicate yep. with any coaches you may be working with. Is there anything you'd add to that? Yeah, I think that's that's really important. Is to, and I, I probably say this all the time, is is about listening to your to your own body and your own responses. And and you know, if you do a very similar session every Wednesday, you know, and all of a sudden you're just feeling really ordinary, and you know, that's it's actually okay. Um, people have not great sessions, you know, regularly doesn't mean you're going to, you know, be have a bad performance down the track. But you know, if you're constantly having, you know. Um, if you're constantly feeling, you know, for a, a, a period of time where you, you don't feel like you're responding like you should with your training and backing off is um, not just okay, but probably what you actually need to be doing. Um, and that sometimes that forced, sometimes the bodies, you know, it's like people get injured sometimes when they're, um, you know, they do a big block of training and, you know, you're running and all of a sudden you, you get an injury. And it's almost like the body's way of saying, come on, you need to, you know, maybe be a little bit smarter about how you're doing things and I think that's you know that's the case with you know your poor quality sessions it's a little maybe just start to to listen to your body a little bit and say well it's it's not only okay to take a day off here or there but it's actually probably good for your overall adaptation because most people when they get into a, an overtraining state is it's usually about not recovering enough um, and not backing off when when they need to. Yeah, and, that, and that's a great segue into looking at what the outcomes can be when recovery yeah. isn't optimised. And, you know, so the takeaway I've got there is back off when you need to. Uh, you know, don't beat yourself up. Don't make that fatalistic flaw, perhaps not fatalistic, but that flaw yeah. of pushing harder. Um, yes. And it comes back to your definition, restoring athletes physically as well as psychologically to uh, train or compete at the required level. So Shona, you mentioned that phrase overtraining and I did want to ask mm. you what, a, what happens when recovery doesn't go well, so to speak? Mm, yeah. And um, I think one of the things that we see and, you know, overtraining is, I guess, a, you know, a popular word. What we, we I think my time at the Institute probably came across three or four 
athletes who you would consider as overtrained. Um, so that's not many. Um, so suffering from, you know, fully blown overtraining syndrome. As I said before, sometimes we see people become injured or they become ill and they kind of back off before they get to that point of becoming, you know, seriously overtrained. But of those athletes that um, that we saw, um, all of them were, I would say, under-recovered. Um, they were certainly doing a fair amount of training, um, but they had either a significant amount of stress in their life or were doing shift work or were doing something that caused them to um, to not be able to recover properly. So this idea of overtraining is all about training. Um, and that It may be the case for some people, but typically I think it's, it's really around the people's ability to recover from what they normally do um, is is diminished the takeaway there is, is i guess it's not just about training more it can be about neglecting the recovery uh yes and what staggers me is you know yourself perhaps the most uh experienced clinically uh, you know, in terms of applying the science and also research based one of the most experienced on the planet in th- really 15 16 years at the pointy edge of sport here in australia you only saw strictly three or four people who were mm. really overtrained. What we see sometimes is people have maybe a medical underlying issue and, and therefore they're not really classified as overtrained. I think we're getting better at managing loads and understanding when to back off um, and that sort of let's just do crazy, crazy volume and crazy high intensities is is kind of um, changing a little bit uh, and we're getting better at recovery. So we're getting better at interest Introducing those things as a whole. So um, I think when we talk about overtraining syndrome, we're really talking about, you know, this really persistent uh, decrease in performance and increase in mood um, that's not really accompanied by anything medical. So I think a lot of the times what we see is, you know, it's a post-viral syndrome or there's actually something um, medical going on and people sort of say, I'm overtrained. I'm like, well, by definition, you're not. <laughs> um, you've actually got, um, you know, you've got an issue around a virus, or you've got a medical issue. So I think if you really stick to the classic de- definition, um, we don't really see that many. And uh, it'd be, it's more a case of being under recovered. And you, you know, you were cited mm. in once again Christy Ashwinden's uh, recent publication, "Good to Go," as you know, referencing that there's some UK researchers that have proposed tr- uh, changing the. The label, if you like, of overtraining syndrome to this W U U P S mm-hmm. unexplained mm-hmm. underperformance Underperform. syndrome. Do you think that'll uh, take off, or it'll take a bit of time to, to permeate? Yeah, I think it makes sense as a as a um, descriptor because um, you don't. There is no explanation, so it's it that makes more sense than overtraining because, as I said, it's not always overtraining. But I think one of the hardest things is that um, it's really hard to do research in this area. Um, and as I said, we see so few athletes um, that actually are classically overtrained or have overtraining syndrome. So the if you look at the research over the last few years, there hasn't been a lot come out in that particular area. People are focusing more on recovery rather than overtraining. So I think it over time, it will it will probably catch on, but maybe not as fast as other areas, just because it's such a difficult area to study and research. Yeah, and uh, changing uh, labels can <laughs> descriptors can take decades. I've observed <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, for sure. People like the the easy things that they know about. <laughs> yeah, and you know, largely it's harmless, but the underlying messages are, are what matters. Shona, yeah. before we explore some of the modalities, and you know, you've touched on the cornerstones by uh, by reference but let's explore them sleep and nutrition i just want to ask you this and it seems once again like such an obvious question but i know there's more to it how does an athlete recognize if they are recovering well in other words i guess mm-hmm. this feeds into quantification of it uh, what data is useful what isn't i've heard you speak about mood over to you yep. shona yeah, it's it's almost like I mean that question is the 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 question that I get asked the most that I don't really have a really good answer for. I don't Sorry. know if anyone else does either, but um, to be able to tell if an athlete has recovered adequately is is really difficult. And because we don't measure performance all the time, um, you know, performance is obviously a gold standard, but it's not something that you can measure regularly. So we do really rely on either quality of training. 
So one of the things is, you know, as I was saying earlier, you know, you do a certain session that you're normally quite used to doing um, and you've got your metrics for that, whether it's simply time or speed or whatever it might be, um, and you find that you can't do it to the level that you could or you do it to the same level but it feels harder, like your perception of effort feels harder. So it's almost like this uncoupling between um, what you're doing, so the output, and how you feel doing it. You know, sometimes you can do a session and you can feel great and sometimes you can do a same session and feel not so great. So I think it's being aware of that. And for those who like to measure and monitor, um, subjective questions around that are really good. Um, so, you know, how did you how did you feel doing that? Um, you know, what's your rating of perceived exertion? And, you know, how did you actually feel while you were doing that sort of standardised session? Um, the other thing is that a lot of... Um, uh, athletes will do is uh, just ask, you know, simple questions around how sore you are, how fatigued you are, how well you slept, what's your mood like, what's your motivation like, just a couple of really simple key questions that once you track over time, um, you can kind of get a, you know, a bit of an idea of how you respond to, to different phases of training. And, and you know, it's also knowing that, um, you know, fatigue is not a bad thing um, and we don't need to be re- fully recovered it all the time um, but what you're looking for is you know when you want to be recovered and when you want to feel good and you don't um, that's probably the sign that you're um, that you're not fully fully recovered so I think for most people it's around just getting some um, subjective data just recognizing sort of how they're feeling and also paying attention to to the quality of their training and uh, Stephen Siler uh, likes to term it mm-hmm. kiss keep it simple scientist keep it simple. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no it's so true and i mean you look now there's some you know team sports who've got you know data scientists and data analysts and you know they're collecting so much data and if you've got the people that can um, interpret that data feed it back to the coach and the staff in a really simple way that they get all well and good. Um, But I think there's a lot of people that just collect data for data's sake and um, either can't interpret it, don't interpret it. um, And then it's like, well, we're all just, you're wasting people's time if you're just, you know, collecting and and not doing anything with it. Yeah. It's that uh, McNamara fallacy. Not everything that's measured, you know, is important, right? It's that's exactly right. But it's understanding what is important. Uh, Shona, so at the practical level, uh, gauging someone's status of being recovered, you know, you mentioned getting some subjective data. I know, for example, at the Australian Institute of Sport, the athlete monitoring system was uh, was established, and that's obviously at a professional level. Um, is it okay for amateur athletes just to subjectively gather their data by self-reflection and asking themselves the questions? Yeah, I think that's actually like, you know, when you don't have someone else who's looking over your data, so, you know, obviously at AIS you've got the staff around them that want those numbers to be able to interpret and feed back. Um, But if you're just, you know, if you don't have a team of people around you, um, I think just paying attention and whether you write that down in a diary or whether you, you you know, you just have it in your own head, I think that that's a really important skill to, um, to have and to learn to do if it's not something that you currently do. And, you know, we often talk about that around sleep as well, is that just getting people to pay, oh, so I did this, that. That, you know, before sleep, oh, and this is how I feel this morning, rather than just going on blindly um, and then then not really putting um, the pieces together. So I think having people subjectively, you know, thinking about their recovery and thinking about how they feel, whether they write it down in a diary or not, and a lot of different training management tools now allow you to fill out some simple questions. Um, But if not, you have your own training diary, just writing it down. And then, you know, then you can look back you know, a years later and go, oh, that's right. That summer I did this volume and I didn't do so great and I felt pretty ordinary um, or this really worked for me and I felt great and I was recovering really well. That's about the volume that I should be doing. Um, and so, yes, I think having people have insight into their own recovery is really important. So pay attention. It's a good motto for life, Shona. <laughs> <laughs> um, transcends everything, recovery, science and beyond. It does.
You're listening to Associate Professor Dr. Shona Halson, sports recovery expert on this and expert edition. Today's show is brought to you by Physiocram. Physiocram is a topical massage cream containing natural plant-based ingredients ideal for the temporary relief of muscular aches and pains. If you're conscious of what you put on your body, you'll be happy to know that Physiocram does not contain parabens or hydroxybenzoates. And its non-greasy formula doesn't leave any sticky residue behind. Physiocram can be found Australia-wide at your local Coles, chemist or health store, as well as via their online store. They've offered listeners of the show 20% off all products over at the online shop, physiocram.com.au, by simply using the coupon code POGO, that's P-O-G-O. Physiocram is the cream of choice of POGO Physio. Hurting sucks and Physiocram have got your back. Today's episode is also brought to you by Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to complete their rehabilitation, get back to their physical best, and in doing so, cross their physio finish line. Our philosophy is simple. We do not want to see you for a session more than what you require to get across your physio finish line. We simply want to see you get back to your best and out there enjoying the things that you so love. To find out more about Pogo Physio's award-winning services, including our one-hour initial appointment or our popular online rehabilitation telehealth services, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. For now, let's jump back with Associate Professor Shona Halson on this expert edition on all things athlete recovery. Let's jump over and explore, you know, something I know you're near and dear to with your professional work is is the importance of sleep as a recovery tool. So, uh, Shona, take it away. Yeah, look, I think... And I could bore your listeners for hours <laughs> on how important sleep is. I just hope now that the the message is out there that this is, you know, the best thing that you can do for yourself psychologically, physically, you know, even outside of sport now we're seeing the relationship between mental health and sleep, um, relationship with cognitive performance, relationships to cardiovascular health, diabetes, you name it. Um, and when you think about it, almost all biology runs on a circadian clock. Um, so even our immune cells run um, um, are, are influenced by our body clock. So every time we go out and think, well, we can skimp on sleep, there's a there's a consequence because there are things that are supposed to happen when you're awake and there are things that are supposed to happen when you're asleep. And when we start cutting out that time that we're spending sleeping, there has there, there's ramifications. And, you know, the research now, as I said, in a range of different areas is really starting to show this is something that is really important. And, you know, Thomas Edison, good bloke, invented the light bulb, <laughs> but um, pretty smart fella, um, but actually has um, has done um, not great things for <laughs> um, for our ability to, um, to sleep because now we can do shift work because we can work at night. Um, we can also stay up late because we have lights, we have smartphones now, we have all kinds of things that get in our way of sleep. And and certainly in my experience with athletes, there are a small number of athletes who have a medical sleep disorder. So they have sleep apnea or they have restless legs or they have something medical. But I would say the majority of people um, just do strange behaviours um, and do things that impair their sleep. Mm. Um, so I really look at it in terms of, yes, okay, one sleep is important. How do we how do we get athletes to uh, or people to get better sleep? And I think there's a couple of things to consider. There's I, th- I talk about us versus them. So the them is, okay, the athletes might have too much caffeine. They might be on their phones late, uh, social media, video games, whatever it might be. They might just not be prioritizing sleep. And then there's the us. There's the things that we do, you know, early morning training sessions. Whose idea was that? 
you know, that's not a great way. We know that people who have early morning training sessions are the worst sleepers. Um, so we still have, you know, sports that want to train at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. We know that people, and for some people who have to work, that's that's your only option, right? But for a lot of other lot of other sports, that that's absolutely not necessary. Um, there's people might have to we might have to travel, and instead of flying the night before and getting a good night's sleep when you arrive, we get someone up really early to get the first flight out. So there's things that we do around scheduling that can be prob- <clears throat> excuse me problematic, and then there's things that athletes do behaviorally um, that can be problematic. So, um, but I think the biggest challenge around sleep is people know. Um, people know what they should do. It's how do we change behaviors to get them to do what they know they should. Yeah. And, you know, it's such a, such a, as you say, a conversation point uh, and so much in it. Shona, you know, you simply said, and I think it was so beautiful and simple, things are supposed to happen when we're awake and things are supposed to happen when we're asleep. Uh, practically, what, what are some of those things that are meant to happen when we're asleep? Yeah, so basically it's a time of physical and mental restoration. Um, so if you look at from a physical side of things, there's, you know, when I'm when I'm talking to, um, to especially to to football players, you know, you talk about the growth hormone release that happens during sleep. You know, we talk about testosterone. You know, there's there's hormones that um, that are there to help repair the muscle. Um, so all these things that people would like to take that are illegal, you know, this the body's doing it during sleep. Um, and and so there's this physical restoration, so repair of the muscle. Um, but the sleep is also really, really important for the brain, and that's where we know quite a bit about. So there's quite a bit of evidence now um, about um, you know sleep is really important for um, the, for the for the brain in terms of memory and learning and reinforcing things you've learned and long term memory and all those kinds of things. Um, and when you are sleep deprived, that's when you see particularly changes early on with with things around brain and cognitive function. So reaction time goes, cognitive function, your ability to, to think fast, make good decisions, um, those kinds of things are, are, are typically affected. So it is both from um, a, a physical side of things with repair, regeneration, fixing the immune system, and then it's also around the brain. So get it, one of the theories is around, um, it's essentially a bit of a brain dump. So what happens is when you sleep, the information that you don't need, you get rid of. The information that is important, um, you store as long, you begin to start to store the process as long-term memory um, and that frees up more space to be able to put more information in there the next day. Um, And so that's probably one of the theories that's gaining the most um, attention as to why sleep is is really so, so important for the brain. But yes, both both physical and um, psychological um, and mental recovery is really influenced by sleep. And you know, there's the, there's those two domains once again that fitted into the definition you gave of recovery, restoring the physical and psychological or mental side of an athlete to be ready for the required task or work. Shona. Uh, bone health. Uh, mm-hmm. I know at your time at the Australian Institute of Sport, I, I believe you were involved with some research there around the links to bone health for athletes. I'm a sports physio dealing with endurance athletes, so pretty much you can imagine my caseloads typically bone injuries <laughs> and tendon injuries. Uh, myself, yeah. I was surprised at 36 to discover low bone density. There's a genetic component, mm-hmm. I'm sure, but mm-hmm. also I reflect on you know fairly long days clinically in a room and training early, mm-hmm. often in the dark and. You know, and, yep. and, and and cutting sleep short. Um, you know, you know what what links are there to bone health and, and sleep? Mm. Yeah. So at the moment, it's one of those things. It's one of those areas that we, you know, you can see physiologically the relationship. Um, so you know, and I don't need to tell you this, but, you know, bones constantly remodeling Mm. and there's, you know, hormonal factors in that. Um, And again, when you look at sleep and how important it is around hormones and hormonal release, um, you can understand, and there's a little bit of a small amount of research to suggest that poor sleep um, may increase your risk of stress fractures and or decrease your ability to recover from that. Um, So it is really sort of new and there's not a lot of good science 
yet to to really give that link, but you can kind of understand based on the based on the physiology. So, um, you know, it's like sleep is important for for muscle, for you know, it's probably uh, obviously important for bone and important for soft tissues and a whole lot of other areas that we just quite haven't got to yet in terms of the research. But um, yeah, I would not surprise me when you know you if you're you know injured athletes, um, as you know, probably don't sleep so well because they've got soreness um, and you know potentially stress as well no one likes to be injured um and then you know pretend this, this is the time that you really want them to be sleeping because you want them to use that sleep as a period of of repair um not just for the muscles but for the bones or other soft tissue etc shona uh one of the things i find fascinating is this paradox that uh, you know of I've heard you you mention and uh, it's reflected in once again good to go. But it's this 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 notion that fatigue doesn't always equal sleepiness. So mm-hmm. an athlete in really heavy training, uh, you would just assume would be falling asleep, you know, in, in a blink in an instant. But can mm. you can you speak to this? Like I'd call it a yeah. paradox that it's not the case. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's it's really interesting. And I'm sure, you know, some of your listeners might have experienced it too. You know, maybe you've done a really a, a long race or um, you've been, you've spent a lot of time, you know, in a high intensity training block um, and you feel fatigued and you walk and you see athletes, you know, they're walking around tired all the time, but that doesn't mean they're actually sleepy. Um, so when we ask questions around sleep, we're very careful to ask about sleepiness and not, and not fatigue. Um, and you would think that um, pe- athletes getting around this tired from all of the training that they're doing would sleep um, and they'd sleep well and they'd go into a good deep sleep. But there's been a couple of studies and, and we've done one of them as well where um, there was a really high intensity training block um, and the athletes had more disturbed sleep. And what we think it might be related to is um, especially like if you look back to you know prehistoric times, um, people when there was a danger or a threat whether that and, and back then it was obviously usually like a physical threat, um, people wouldn't sleep or someone would stay awake to make sure that they protected the group. So when you have like a fight or flight response um, because you're stressed about something, you tend to not sleep as well because you're still alert because there's danger out there. Uh, And so what we think is that these high levels of training and the physical stress that comes for that comes from that, the the brain is still interpreting that as as stress uh, and essentially you're getting poorer quality sleep because there's this part of you that's still alert because um, there is there's a a stress occurring. It just happens to be to be a physical one. And I think most people can maybe relate to that if you talk about, you know, maybe you're you're really busy and you've got lots on and you're moving house and you've got all this stuff and you go to bed and you can hardly sleep because your brain's just ticking over. Um, So that's one um, way of demonstrating that, you know, this psychological stress can can um, impede sleep. But we do tend to see this idea of big training blocks instead of um, being something that results in good sleep might be disturbed disturbing sleep for some people because it's just another form of stress yeah okay so that that kind of makes sense uh, that high level training can be that that stressor and that fight or flight and you, yeah. you mentioned the dinosaurs and, and thomas edison so you know there's there's <laughs> there's history according to shona <laughs> 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 there is. I've often wondered how the dinosaurs slept, but anyway, <laughs> the no. small ones probably didn't sleep really. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely brilliant, Shona. Uh, the the thing I find fascinating, you know, you said part of your, your your professional work is educating corporates, educating athletes, consulting with Nike, consulting with leading brands around the world about sporting teams, about the importance of sleep. But you know, to many of this cohort. You know, the corporate world, elite athletes, recreational and competitive athletes, they're competitive by nature. They want to tick a checklist off of do A to Z. And yet, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, a, a prior featured uh, expert on, on the show shared around sleep physician, Dr. David Cunnington, was, you know, not, not instilling anxiety about, you know, a checklist for sleep. So how do you weigh up that balance of not creating anxiety yeah. in, in often already, you know, achieving type personalities? Yeah, and that is such a great insightful question because I think when a lot of people go in um, to educate people around sleep, they 
just give the one side of the story, which is how important it is and all these things that you need to do. When if you look at really good sleepers, they do nothing mm. because they don't have to, right? So, um, so the couple of things that I try to do, especially when I'm when I'm talking to athletes, is to reassure them that one or two or even three sort of poor night sleep, it's not going to destroy your physiology. You've trained twenty years, three nights is you know, you're not going to decrease your VO two max and ruin your heart rate. <laughs> you know, so a couple of bad nights is not the end of the world. Normally, what the body will do will that next night go into a really good, solid, deep sleep to, to get over it. Um, so the thing is to not get too overly stressed around having a couple of bad nights sleep. Nobody sleeps perfectly every night of the week. What we really want to do is say, okay, um, sleep is important. Let, let's just not do habits and strategies and and um, behaviours that are going to interfere with with that sleep. So it's not more. It's not really around. Okay, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. It's okay. Let's just not be on our phones all night. Mm. Um, you know, let's think about our caffeine use and let's try and put the picture together. And and I think part of this what becomes really important in this conversation is so we can now access sleep accurately or not accurately, um, through things like Fitbit and Whoop and all those kinds of things where you can get data every single day of your life. Now, I don't think that that's particularly healthy for most people, um, especially people that are struggling to sleep because, you know, if they have something underlying, you can't just force yourself to sleep. You know, you can't just make yourself sleep if you've got a, if you have a, if you have an issue. So, sometimes having too much information is not a good thing um, and it can cause people to get that to become over anxious and overthink their sleep. So what we would tend to do is come in and do a block of monitoring for maybe two weeks, see what happens on weekends, see what their um, habitual patterns are, um, and then give them some individual feedback and say, "Now off you go. We don't want to. We don't need to measure you every single night of your life." Um, and again, one bad night is not the end of the world. So I think it's this combination of look, sleep is important. Um, we want you to develop good habits. We don't don't want you to get too worried about one or two nights. It's almost like saying, you know, if you have one or two bad training sessions, it's not going to make you, you know, a terrible athlete. If you have two amazing training sessions, it's not going to make you the best athlete in the world. It's about what you do consistently over time. So let's make some good habits and some good patterns and try to do this as often as we can. Um, but um, ideally, you don't want them to get into that position where they're just really anxious and, and thinking too much about sleep. That's when you've got to come in with some other other strategies. Yeah, so so uh, encouraging and reassuring it, you know, that, that education, you know, and the, the knowledge that a couple of nights of poor or affected sleep won't physiologically throw someone under the bus. No, exactly. And sometimes what the, re what the research shows is even if you're completely sleep deprived, what happens is your perception of effort just changes. So things feel harder. And I think whether you're an athlete or not, you understand that. You know, you, when you're jet lagged, you've had no sleep, and you have to sit in a conference all day, it doesn't feel so <laughs> flash. Um, and so your perception of, of effort, especially if you're an athlete, might feel a bit high. Might, things might just feel a little bit harder. But your physiology is generally protected if it's only very acute sleep deprivation. If you're talking, you know, months of living life at five or six hours, of sleep a night, okay, then we're dealing with something else. You're listening to Associate Professor Shona Halson on this and expert edition on all things athlete recovery. If you missed last week's episode, it was an interest edition featuring the incredible story of father and son Tommy and Owen Hughes. Tommy, 59, Owen, 34, just broke the Guinness World Record for the combined fastest marathon time. Tommy ran an incredible 227, and Owen, after just a few years of running, ran an incredible 231. And last week's episode explored the highs, lows, and learnings across a lifetime of running for Tommy and just several years from his son, Owen. It's been incredibly well received. Here's a little snippet of what you may have missed. I've played a lot of about a five side football, maybe once or twice a week. Um, sort of just keep me fit, but I smoked and I drunk and I partied a bit, 
No, running was never in my radar at that time. To enjoy the full episode or other interest editions of the show, be sure to jump over to explore the show archives from wherever it is that you enjoy the show from. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured expert, Associate Professor Shona Halson on all things athlete recovery. Shona, uh, what trends are you seeing professionally with your work uh, around the world when it comes to sleep, say, with sporting teams? Uh, what, what changes implementations? You mentioned scheduling, not flying athletes out the first flight to get, on, you know, to get out of the country if, if they can benefit from having an uninterrupted night's sleep. So what sort of things are you seeing? Yeah, I think definitely seeing an interest from, you know, high level elite teams wanting to measure and understand um, how their players or athletes are sleeping. So just getting some some good data um, and making some some corrections. I think one of the other things that's important to consider in this sort of environment is that almost the higher level athlete that you get to in terms of you know, really, really elite professional teams, particularly in the States where they're paid a lot of money, the harder it is to get access to these guys, to be able to give them, you know, to be able to monitor and give feedback. So those types of places are often looking at how do we make a difference in the current environment that we're in, where it can be challenging to have um, athletes actually wear sleep monitors. Um, So I think there's a combination of trying to get some some data on their athletes and generally how they're sleeping, how they respond to travel, how they respond to night games. Um, So there's that kind of interest. And then, you know, there's a lot of interest at the moment because sleep is such a a popular thing at the moment, not just in athletes, but, you know, in the general population is is there's a lot of um, new gadgets coming out, new things that can portably measure sleep or that say that they can increase sleep or there's things with brain training and brain stimulation. So seeing a lot of those things come out, nothing yet that's really hit the mark, um, but that's what people are trying to do now. So the example is um, I've only got six hours of sleep. How can I make that six hours the best I can? Um, rather than saying I probably need to prioritise and maybe get seven, seven and a half, it's like, well, I can only get six, so how do I hack my sleep um, to get the best quality that I can in that six hours? So that's kind of the sort of questions that are that are getting asked around sleep. And napping, uh, are you seeing a bit of a, you know, a, an encouragement towards athletes taking naps? Yeah, I think there's a consider becoming a more of a consideration for that, that it is important um, and especially important for those um, particular athletes that are sleep deprived. So, you know, the only way to get over sleep deprivation is to sleep. You know, you can have as much caffeine as you like and you might feel good for a short period of time, but the only way to truly get over sleep deprivation is to sleep. And so if you're a swimmer or a triathlete or a rower and you are up super early most mornings, and it is pretty hard to go to bed early enough to get the sleep that you need if you've got to wake up at 5 or 4.35, 5.30, you know, it's hard to go to bed early enough to still get your eight or nine hours in. Um, so you've, the only way to top up is, is to have have a nap and so there's a lot of um especially professional teams over in the states who have a lot of money for great facilities putting in you know sleep pods sleep areas um where the the players can just come and have a have a quick nap in between sessions if they want so i think the key to napping is that it can be great if you're sleep deprived um but you know just napping for the sake of napping if you don't need it is is probably only going to decrease your quality of sleep that night um but yes if you're sleep deprived it's it's the best thing that you can do yeah so interesting Shona I mean there's so many areas we could go and I'm, and I'm conscious of our allotted time the you know you mentioned nutrition's a pillar of good recovery mm-hmm. uh, you know in, in simple terms uh, in, in a short short way what, what advice would you issue to you know generally around nutrition yeah I, and I will throw the caveat out there that while I've done some research in nutrition I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not a dietitian um, but I think at the moment one of the most important things is to get advice from good places um, you know there's Netflix documentaries <laughs> and there's all kinds of things that take science and spins it on its head in maybe not the best way so I think getting advice from 
the right people. Um, I think we have to be, you know, there are times when people need to drop body weight and, you know, to do that in a safe way, you know, talking to, you know, to the right people. And obviously I've been fortunate at AIS working with, you know, some of the best dietitians mm. in the world. And, and I just know that um, the advice and the practical tips and things that you can get from a, a, a really good dietitian, um, it's just invaluable. But um, I think the basics obviously around, you know, the right amounts of, you know, carbohydrates, right amounts of protein, adequate hydration, you know, again, eating eating good, healthy, quality food, you know, there's no there's no substitute for it. And um, uh, we know links, there's some links now between nutrition and sleep um, and obviously nutrition and overall recovery. And, you know, while there's lots of fads and different things out there of diets that people can do these days, you know, the science is really clear on, you know, high intensity, long duration sports and the requirement for carbohydrate in terms of, of um of uh, of adequate um, muscle recovery and glycogen restoration. So, um, but again, there may be times, and the AIS and you know Louise Burke, the queen of sports dietitian, <laughs> um, who's done some brilliant studies around periodizing nutrition and you know she's very pragmatic and understands that there are times when you may want to have a lower energy intake for whatever reason, and you may want to have a low carbohydrate. Um, uh, intake for whatever reason, but that goes around your training. So high training days, high intakes. Um, low training days, lower intakes. Um, so I think again, this whole theme of periodization works in really well with training, nutrition, um, and recovery. Yeah, no, fantastic. The two pillars: sleep and mm-hmm. uh, and good nutrition. And you know, you mentioned fads and you know, some different things. I mean, there's been an explosion in different modalities if you like in recovery in recent years and, and very briefly Shona and I know this is challenging now when there's so much you could you could share with your expertise mm. around these but the, the role of things like compression garments and mm-hmm. uh, contrast therapy uh, immersion mm-hmm. uh, can you speak mm-hmm. to those yeah so uh, I am a believer in you know compression garments for recovery and you know contrast baths and ice baths um, when done well, I think the way that I see those sorts of modalities is, um, and I think of recovery as a as a pyramid. You know, your base is sleep and nutrition, and these things like contrast water therapy and compression are the kinds of things that you add on top of your base. They don't substitute those. There's, as I said earlier, there's no quick quick fixes, but there is some good data on compression. There's some good data on water immersion, especially in a, in a competition setting. Um, there's sort of less evidence around the sort of cryotherapy chambers um, um, and, and less evidence around some of the muscle stimulating, brain stimulating type devices. Um, but I, I think for the the sort of big ones that people might commonly use around compression, ice baths or pool recovery, there's enough evidence to suggest that they're, they're, you're not wasting your time and money with those. Yeah, certainly. And uh, massage therapy, uh, mm-hmm. Shona, that one? Yeah, um, I'm definitely a believer um, and whether it's maybe – not 100% purely for recovery. Um, so the data around just having, um, a, you know, soft tissue therapy when you've got a short turnaround um, before you have to do another training session or another event is 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 not super strong. Um, but just massage in terms of um, you know dealing with injuries, injury prevention, maintenance, those kinds of things. I'm I'm a believer, and um, you might be familiar with some of the work of Tom Best um, out of the UK. He does some he started out with animal models and sort of vibration and um, um, and soft tissue, and now is moving into human models, but doing some really mechanistic stuff around the benefits of, of massage and vibration for the repair of the muscle. So to send, you know, signalling um, pathways um, to to um, help repair the muscle. So there's some sort of interesting stuff coming out in that space, you know. And I'm, I'm sure you, know, I'm sure you know, you know, the old days of I'm going to, I'm going to have a massage to get rid of lactate. Um, you know, you're going to get rid of lactate. <laughs> Active recovery is where it's at. <laughs> massage is probably not what you need, what you need to be doing. But I do believe in the right. Um, uh, for the right things that, you know, massage soft tissue is is a really important part of the 
um, training program. And done well, not on a device or a smartphone whilst getting the, the treatment can really be that, that purpose, permission given time for an athlete uh, of any level just to, to switch off, right? To switch off 100%. So another thing that's quite popular or getting pop- popular now is flotation tanks, where, mm. you know, essentially salt tank, sleep, uh, um, a sensory deprivation. And one of the things I love about it is you can't take a phone in there. Um <laughs> And so, you know, you actually have to have, you know, half an hour to an hour of forced, you know, and a lot of athletes will sleep, take the phone away from them, then they will actually sleep in those mm. things. So, um, there is something to be said for recovery devices um, or, you know, in a, I do see athletes still in, in ice baths and things when they've got their hands out and they're on their phone, but <laughs> typically less use in, in, um, in, in water immersion. So, again, I think any time we can in encourage um, decreased phone use mm. is, is a good thing. Shona, you have been so generous with your time and uh, and also your, your knowledge. Uh, I'm going to ask you a very difficult question, and that is if you had to boil everything you've learned uh, through your you know extensive career to date into one piece of advice to help listeners of this show perform at their own physical best, yeah. what, would it, what would it be? I think, and I have said it, is is to listen to your body and really pay attention. I think nobody knows you better than you, um, and to not be afraid to take some, you know, when you when you feel like you might not be where you want to be, um, it's totally okay to take some downtime and probably actually a good thing. So, um, you know, people think people often think, oh, recovery is all like you can tell me not to do things and that fatigue's bad. That's not the case. Um, you know, you may be able to do more when you're adequately recovered, but if you're not, um, you you know, to take some time and the, really the only way that the the general population can do that is to pay attention to um, to their own body and not ignore things when things are maybe not going so well. Ah, wonderful. And a physical challenge for the week, Shona. Every guest issues the listener with a physical challenge. What is Shona mm-hmm. Hallison's challenge going to be? Yeah, this is – it's kind of physical. It's kind of not. So I don't know if I'm being a bit sneaky. <laughs> but um, what a lot of people around sleep do is they know they should go to bed, but they'll watch one more episode of Netflix <laughs> or they'll watch – well, they'll do – they'll scroll through Instagram for a bit longer. So my thing is when you know you should go to bed <laughs> – Go to bed. <laughs> Pay attention. Yes. There's yes. Oh. Physical challenges to get into the get in get out of the lounge room into the bedroom and off the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, sounds so simple, doesn't it, Shona? Uh, but there's the challenge. Absolutely brilliant. So appreciate all you do and who you are. And uh, to find out more about what you're up to, where can uh, listeners head? Uh, so. Probably Twitter is probably where I keep most up to date. I um, don't really do the other social medias. Um, so just, yeah, Shona, Shona Halson on Twitter. So always sort of sharing the students' work and what, and what they're doing. Um, and then, of course, um, Australian Catholic University have a website with some, some basic details on there. But Twitter's probably where, you know, keep most up to date. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, Shona, thank you once again. Right, thanks, Brad. Thanks for the good questions. So there you have it. I trust and I know that you enjoyed this episode featuring Dr. Shona Halson. We'll tag all of Shona's handles up on the show notes over at pogophysio.com.au. Do reach out and let Shona know what it was you enjoyed from her sharings. And also reach out and let her know how you go with that fantastic physical challenge for the week. I'm putting both hands up and I'm going to stick to it this week, or at least use my best efforts. Thank you for those who have been leaving ratings and reviews for the show over on iTunes. Aside from being a lot of fun to read and great feedback, it really does help with the show's visibility. So a plea, if you've been enjoying the show, consider jumping over to iTunes and leaving a brief rating and review. Keep the podsies coming. They are heaps of fun. That is a screenshot of the episode you're enjoying and tagging in the show at Physical Performance Show, plus or minus myself at Brad underscore beer over on social, Instagram and Twitter. It is annual feedback time for the Physical Performance Show, so please have your say. Simply jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash podcast, and at the bottom of the page, you'll see a big green button that says, let us know what you think 
of the show. It's a brief questionnaire, and we'd love to know what it is that you're enjoying, how the show can be improved, and whether supporting the show's production through something like Patreon would be something that you see a value in. We're looking to make the show better year on year, and this annual feedback, as per other years, really does help shape the show for the next 12 months. So thank you in advance for jumping over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash podcast and hitting the big green button. The feedback is open right through until the last episode of 2019, and you go into the draw to win a $50 Amazon gift card. A massive thanks once again to the great folk who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer. Susan Wilkin on all things show administration. Matthew Olden on all things show graphic design. And Oliver Crossley assisting behind the scenes. Another huge thank you to Physiocram. Podcasts are free to download. However, they are not free to produce. And Physiocram, your support helps make this show possible. Don't forget, hit subscribe if you'd like to have the episodes into your device each and every Thursday as they go live. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, episode 191, I'll bring you a conversation that I recently had with US distance running star Sarah Hall. Sarah is the wife of prior featured performer Ryan Hall, who we featured on episode 160. So if you're yet to listen to American marathon record holder Ryan Hall's episode, episode 160, be sure to do that ahead of episode 191 featuring Sarah. Sarah will share her career highs, lows and learnings and having come off the back of an incredible and massive PB at the Berlin Marathon running a Sterling 222.16, Sarah has a lot to say about persisting throughout hardship in order to reach your best. Sarah is looking ahead for the Atlanta 2020 Olympic trials for the US team and touches on why runners know how to dig and persevere. Here's a little snippet of my conversation with Sarah Hall. The best advice I've gotten was from Ryan, which is run the mile you're in. So it's daunting with the marathon, just how many miles stretch out in front of you when when you're at mile three or four and and you can't think about that. You kind of have to just be present with the mile and and know that you're going to have the strength for the future miles. And uh, it's also the title of his book, Run the Mile You're In. So be sure to tune in next week here on the Physical Performance Show. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.